Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. I see some of you have already started to sign in, so we would ask you to just uh, let us know you're here in, your, in the live feed. Just sign in. Um, and I'm trying to, to, to sh share this with uh, some of our groups, and we'll get right under way here in just a second. It won't take but a, hopefully it won't even take a minute. But anyway, we're glad you're here. And uh, we've got a good subject tonight, I think, something that hopefully will interest everyone. And uh, a little bit different, at least from, from the perspective of, of how the subject came up. But uh, then it's, but really it's, it's not anything new or anything that, we've, that you haven't heard before or haven't discussed, perhaps just coming from a different direction. So uh, be signing in. Be sharing this with your groups, uh, just as we've already done, and uh, be thinking about some of your own questions. If you have a question tonight, that's what the program is all about, is answering Bible questions. Your questions, uh, I talk a little bit about something that interests me, and then you can talk a little bit or ask questions about things that are interesting you. Last week, we had several good questions about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit baptism, and its relationship to water baptism. We have some information on the uh, Facebook page relative to that. And then tonight after the program, I'm going to uh, post some of these notes that I, I'm going to use tonight uh, for your benefit. <clears throat> but be signing in. We're so very happy to have you here. Um, I want us to, to look at a quotation. Now, I, I probably need to tell you right off the bat where this comes from. I'm not going to name the individual. That's that's not important. But there are a lot of Facebook pages out there that are associated with brethren, members of the Churches of Christ. And there's a really large group out there, and we post our feed to that. And hopefully some of those folks are joining us tonight listening in. But I was, uh, I'm a member of several of those kinds of pages. And I was out there a day or two ago looking, and I've seen this particular author, a, a brother, uh, put things on the page, and, and you can tell that this person is someone who has uh, been a member of the Church of Christ, but I don't think they are now, and because they're very critical of the church and very critical of things that uh, brethren say or uh, positions, I guess we could say, or uh, teaching that we have uh, been consistent in, and this person has begun to espouse uh, justification by faith only. And we can talk about that a little bit tonight even, but the, the thing that was said that just was so um, unreasonable and so contrary to the scriptures was this remark here that was made that uh, nothing in the law of Moses or any other scripture in the Old Testament authorized a Jewish Messiah that would save both Jews and Gentiles. Now, the author goes on to express that that's why the Jews didn't recognize Jesus Christ. They went by scripture alone based on an entitled interpretation of who God's chosen people were. Well, I'm going to look at that first part, whether or not the Old Testament authorized a, a Messiah to save Jews and Gentiles. And then we're going to try and understand why it was that the Jews didn't recognize Christ. This was not a problem with the law or not even necessarily a problem with uh, the fact that they adhered to the law. And we're going to show that, that, that certainly a Messiah was anticipated in the Old Testament. And not only a Messiah, but a Messiah who would give uh, additional revelation. You'd, you'd have to do a lot of reading, but I, I just thought this was worthwhile tonight from a lot of perspectives because there were plenty of folks who were commenting in the in the feed on this particular discussion that were really uh, confused and were really concerned about what the Bible says and there were people who were not uh, actually clear as to how to approach this question. So the first thing I want, want us to consider is whether or not it is true that nothing in the law of Moses or any other scripture in the Old Testament authorized a Jewish Messiah. We're not going to worry about 
why she thinks that that person thinks that's important right now, but we just want to look at that idea. And I want you to realize that that from the very beginning, and this is why this is important, from the very first page of the Bible to the last page of the Bible, the principal message of Scripture is uh, Jesus is coming. If I were to just summarize the, the Bible, uh, the Messiah will come. That's the theme of the Old Testament. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Messiah has come or the Messiah is here. And then Acts through the end of the New Testament, the Messiah will come again. So Messiah is coming, Messiah has come, and Messiah will come again. And that summarizes the message of the Bible with respect to Jesus or his coming. He's coming, he did come, he died at Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins, satisfying, fulfilling all Old Testament scripture. Jesus himself said that all things that are written to me in, in Moses and the law and the prophets must be fulfilled. And that's Luke chapter 24. So there was definitely something in the Old Testament that, that anticipated, predicted, and led to the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Christ meaning Messiah. And then the fact that this Messiah promised to come again and return, resurrect the righteous dead along with the wicked, and execute judgment and then the righteous would be with him forever so beginning in genesis chapter 3 there in verse 15 after adam and eve sinned god said that one born of woman would crush the head of satan beneath his heel but in the process of doing that satan would bruise him that is bruise the messiah so definitely someone who is the seed of woman is coming and this would end in the destruction of Satan, the end of his rule or his power, the destruction of his kingdom, uh, yet it would result in the bruising of the Messiah. And we know that to have been the, the crucifixion of Christ, but God raised him from the dead because death could not hold him. And so by the resurrection of the dead, from the dead, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power. And Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 reiterate that prince, that truth that's said, stated there in Genesis 3 when the Apostle Paul speaks of Jesus as one who was born of woman, born under the law. In the fullness of time, when, God's, when the time for God's plan came to a head or it came to the place where it was ready to be implemented that God had done all that he intended to do leading up to Christ he was ready to bring Christ into the world and complete the redemptive plan that uh, he was in order to do that the, the Messiah Christ was born of woman well that's what Genesis 3 said uh, that's what uh, Genesis 17 said uh, concerning uh, the descendants of Abraham through Sarah, and that's what um, other passages have said, born of woman, born under the law, and Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. And so here's the fulfillment, so born of woman, born under the law. He was a descendant of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham were given the Mosaic Covenant when God brought them out of Egypt, so he's born under the law. That's the teaching that one is that the, as far as the law of Moses is, is concerned, one is born into a covenant relationship with God or else he comes in through uh, proselyting and, and receiving circumcision. We'll have a little more to say about that in a moment. Now, this is what God purposed to do, and he purposed to accomplish this being born of woman through Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And thee and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so the the blessing Acts chapter 3 and verse uh, 26 the blessing which is Christ who was going to turn us away from our sins that came through Abraham and his lineage with respect to Sarah Genesis 17 verse 16 not some other woman not uh, Hagar not Keturah but through Sarah and we see that the New Testament opens Matthew chapter 1 in verse 1, the New Testament opens with 
uh, the, the genealogy of Christ being discussed, showing that he was a descendant of, of Abraham through David. And there's another aspect of the Messianic uh, program. So the Jews were looking for, and th this is this is what's so astounding about this text, is there's not one scripture either in the Law of Moses or any Old Testament that says there would be a Jewish Messiah. Well, it's on the, almost the first page of the Bible, practically. And and it clearly, Genesis 21, let me just reach over here and get my Bible and, and turn to that text. Genesis 21 um, and verse uh, 12, I believe it is. Let me just turn another page here. Um, and God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, because of and because of thy bondwoman, and, sa and that Sarah had said unto you, uh, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall your seed be called. And so the, the, the lineage of Abraham is going to come through Isaac and, and, and Sarah, Genesis 17, 16. Here now Genesis 21 and verse 12. In Exodus 32, 13, uh, Moses is speaking there and, and speaks of the children of Israel who have been brought out of Egyptian bondage and they're having been brought out of Egyptian bondage and that the, they were going to to come into Canaan and begin to realize the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and then in Genesis 15 and he says there that the promise and he's making reference to the Genesis 15 promise the stars is the your descendants shall be as the stars of heaven or as the sands of the seashore without numbers. He gave that to Abraham. He gave that promise to Isaac. He gave that promise to Jacob. And so it was fulfilled in that lineage. As Jacob is about to die, he blesses the, the children of Israel. And in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, he specifies that the ruler, the one from whom they said there would not a scepter depart from Judah, and that the governor, the ruler, the one who would come, the Messiah, the king who would come, would be of that uh, tribe of Judah. And in uh, Psalm 89, which is based on 2 Samuel 7 and 12, but in Psalm 89, 20 through 36, the psalmist speaks of the sure mercies of David. God had sworn an oath to David, just like he'd sworn an oath to Abraham. That, of the, that he would establish the throne of David forever. And he, God, uh, there in Hebrews 6, when speaking of that and quoting from Genesis 15, the Hebrew writer says that when God swears an oath, he swears by himself because he can swear by no greater that by these two immutable things, the fact that he made the promise and the fact that he gave the oath in his own name, by these two immutable things, the promise because God is true, and the oath, because God can swear by no greater than himself, that by these two immutable things, then the promise is sure. And so that was true of the promise that was made to Abraham, and that was true of the promise that was made to David in 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 89. Now, that promise to da uh, that was coming through Judah to David is fleshed out for us in Ruth chapter 4, verses 11 through 12 where Ruth who had married Boaz you remember she was the the Canaanite woman uh, excuse me the Moabite woman uh, that she had married Boaz who was descended from the Canaanite woman uh, who had uh, had Rahab who had married the the grandfather of Boaz and so we have these two women these two Canaanite women or these two foreign women included in the lineage of Christ, all right? So uh, that the promise comes all the way down to David there at the end of that chapter because his, his, from his little genealogy from Boaz down to David is expressed. And so we see the promise being f fulfilled. So to say that there's nothing in the Old Testament at all that, that, that predicts or authorizes a Jewish Messiah is absolutely ridiculous. Now, if what this person is trying to say is that a Messiah who is going to save people according to the law, well, that was never God's plan. 
and no one has ever thought that that was the case. I don't even believe the Jews think that thought that was the case, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But Jesus as the Messiah is how the New Testament opens there in Matthew chapter 1. And while there were some who questioned the legitimacy of Jesus' birth, I think that's what's in view in John 8, 41, when the Jews say we were not born of fornication. What they're, what they're trying to, to do there is cast some aspersion on Jesus as and, and the miraculous nature of his birth, the fact that he was said to have been the son of Joseph. But Luke makes it clear he was in reality uh, the son of Heli, who was the direct, the direct ancestor of Mary, his mother. And so the, the lineage of Christ in Matthew is through Joseph, his legal father, and, and in Luke it's through, mother, it's through his, his mother Mary all the way back to Adam. And so you, you have these two uh, genealogies of Christ showing that Jesus is truly the son of man. He's truly the son of David. And uh, and that's and the purpose of the Matthew chronology or uh, excuse me genealogy is to establish the, his his legal claim because both Mary and Joseph cross in several of their ancestors in the Davidic line and so they are clearly he is a son of David Joseph was and so was uh, Jesus either by legal claim as the adopted son of Joseph or by actual physical descent. He was a son of David. There's no question about that. There can be no argument made against that. And so when Jesus, uh, most notably there in, I think it's Matthew 21, uh, verse 9, and then again in verse 15, when Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem, what we sometimes refer to as the triumphal entry, Jesus is there hailed as being the son of David. Jesus was popularly recognized among the Jews as the son of David, and that's a title that is a descriptor of the Messiah. He was a son of David, and so these people are looking at Jesus as the Messiah, and that's part of the question that goes on. And you'll remember that the Jews complain about what the people are saying, and they say, Jesus, tell these folks to stop saying this. Tell, tell them to stop giving you this kind of, of praise. And Jesus says, if I forbid them to speak, the very stones would cry out. And so Jesus himself claims the the uh, the appellative of being the son of David. He claims the title of Messiah in that context. And so to argue that there was nothing in the Old Testament about that and that the Jews didn't understand that, Jesus was popularly hailed as being the son of David. Jesus was understood to be the Messiah, and the people were continually asking that question. And so that settles that. There's There's no... Um, way in the world that that cannot be true. Now, uh, we, we go on from here and uh, look at another aspect of this question, which was uh, brought up there. I'm going to scroll back down so I can look at the, at the quote, but said that, uh, the Jews didn't recognize Christ. And he says they didn't recognize Christ because the law didn't authorize a Messiah. Well, that wasn't their problem. And, and then she goes on to talk about this entitled interpretation of who God's chosen people were. I don't think there's anyone that would deny that the Jews had a wrong view of their relationship with God. I think that's best illustrated in, in John chapter 3. When Jesus talks about the new birth and he tells Nicodemus in verse 3 and in verse 5 that he must be born again except a man be born again he shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven except a man be born of water and of the spirit he shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven and Nicodemus turns to Jesus and asks the question can a man be born a second time and uh, or enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born so clearly Nicodemus had this idea that citizenship in the kingdom of heaven was predicated upon having descendant, been a descendant of Abraham or being a descendant of Abraham. Now, the question is whether or not that is a popular view and whether or not that was a biblical view. 
and I think that's important to to understand that. Um, and I'm I'm here to to tell you that that was not a biblical view. And when I say biblical, I mean is that what the law of Moses taught? Did the law of Moses teach that that a a relationship with God is predicated upon one's descent from Abraham? Now. We're going to examine that, and, and, and but we're going to give you some time here in a minute to, to, to ask some questions along this, and I would suggest that even now you start uh, typing those in if, if you think have heard something thus far that suggests something to your mind. But but there in John 3, Nicodemus thought that the fact that he was descended from Abraham is what would determine his kinship with God or his fellowship with God or his citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. But I want you to just, just this is all occurring in the very early days of Jesus' ministry. And remember that when Jesus came to John the Baptist, what is it that John was preaching to folks there? Just get your New Testament and, and, and turn over there to, to Matthew chapter 3. I mean, again, we're talking about how the New Testament opens. And, and so for someone to say, well, it, it was popular, popularly held that uh, all you had to do is be a, be the descendant of Abraham, and so that somehow guaranteed your spiritual relationship. I understand that was a problem. I understand it was even a problem in the New Testament church. But that's not what Jesus taught, and that isn't even what John the Baptist taught. John the Baptist came under the power of the Holy Spirit preaching to the Jews. And, and he's primarily pe preaching to the rulers of, of the Jews. The, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they'd come out to hear him preach. And John says there in verse 9, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. But what is it John had told these people to do? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so there were some who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. And that the fact that they were descended from Abraham. He says, don't say to yourself, we be Abraham's seed. That's not the basis of a relationship to God. And, and, and so John the Baptist knew that. So the New Testament opens with that being almost the very first thing that's being taught. The Gospel of John opens with that being almost the very first thing that's being taught. Jesus saying, look, you're not going to have kingdom relationship or kingdom citizenship based upon your descent from Abraham. So this idea that somehow the Jews just never had been taught this, and you go back to the law of Moses, which is the argument uh, from which Paul is making his Romans 2 argument, he goes back to the law of Moses. There in Deuteronomy 6, for an example, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy might. The, their relationship to God was based upon a heart relationship. So I said, well, wait a minute. What was, wasn't circumcision given? Didn't they have to be circumcised? Isn't that what Paul or the Hebrew writer means in Hebrews chapter uh, 8 when he quotes from Jeremiah and says, uh, that uh, not every man uh, uh, will know the Lord says so not you won't, the, the covenant the old covenant was based on uh, their birth and being told know the Lord at some point but said that won't be done anymore everyone will know the Lord yes there's definitely a difference in how one entered the the mosaic covenant as opposed to the covenant of Christ that's I don't think that's the issue here and granted it, clearly, in Hebrews 8, which is a quotation of Jeremiah 31, so that means the Old Testament is teaching this, and we're going to show this again in just a moment, that, that covenant relationship was anticipated in the Old Testament with a new covenant that would be predicated upon faith. So to say that there's no scripture in the Old Testament that predicted a Jewish Messiah who would bring a new covenant is just ridiculous. That's just wrong. And any argument then that one wants to make on that or impute to somebody else because they think they're inter they think someone else is interpreting the scriptures just like the Jews did, did is wrong. That just that just doesn't hold water. 
even in the limited G commission of Jesus there in Matthew 10, when he sent the, the apostles out, he sent them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. And so someone says, well, see there, Jesus wasn't preaching to Gentiles. That's not what Jesus is saying in Matthew 10. Jesus is doing what Paul recognized in the Roman epistle there in verse 1 and verse 16, that the gospel was to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Jew, because of their special relationship as the prepared people of God, that's why he sent John the Baptist, Malachi 4, is to prepare them. And the preparation of the Jews and the particular unique relationship that the Jews had was still based on faith in Christ. It was not based on the fact that they were Jews. And so the Jews today, if they could show that they were descended from Abraham, which they cannot, but even if they could show they were descended from Abraham, that doesn't make them the chosen people. The fact that they were chosen is that they were chosen for service. They were chosen to do something. And this is important. So uh, there in Matthew 10 and verse 18, Jesus in the Great Commission says, And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So the apostles were going to testify to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you, talking about the apostles, when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for this in the same hour shall be given to you what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. They'll persecute you in this city and another city. And then he goes on there in verse 23. And you will not have gone over all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come. And so this is the beginning of their commission. But they're going to the Gentiles. Jesus even appeared to the Apostle Paul and said, Lo, I send you to the Gentiles. So when we look at the New Testament, as far as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is concerned, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the angels there in Matthew 2, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. That's not a, that's a message that includes Gentiles. Uh, John the Baptist, all of these uh, beings taught salvation was universally offered to the Jews and the Gentiles, and they taught that that offering of salvation was by faith. You know, another example of that is uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 32 when, when, when Jesus is being brought into the temple by his mother and uh, it's Simeon who comes out uh, to meet them and he begins to, to speak by the Holy Spirit and, and just listen to what he says. I mean, this is just a few months after Jesus is born. And the Holy Spirit says to him that he will be a light to the Gentiles to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So Jesus is going to be a light to the Gentiles and to the people Israel. And, and this is said of, of by Simeon under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Jews believed otherwise, we'll stop right here because we, we, we need to have some questions coming in. But the, the fact, uh, if the Jews believed otherwise, they did so contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. Excuse me, to the teaching of the Old Testament. They did so contrary to the Revelation. So let's, let's, let's recapitulate. One, the Old Testament from the very first page practically anticipates a Messiah who will be descended of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through through the tribe of Judah and David in particular that will be the Messiah that he would be born of woman born under the law and that he would save his people from their sins that's Matthew 1 and verse 21 or John chapter 1 behold the Lamb of God who takes away and I get it John 1 29 who takes away the sins of the world that's, that includes the, the Gentiles and we're going to examine that in just a little bit further, but let's back up here and see. We've got a lot of people that signed in tonight, so I'll just scroll down here 
appreciate all those kind words and greetings. Um, I got a question now. I'll come back to your question, John, if we have a little time. Uh, I could spend a whole program on that. And then this last comment. And so, so in this last comment, is, is folks are just saying that this is what they found. I, I don't know that the person who, whom I'm quoting tonight is even paying attention to what I'm saying. And that's fine. I, it doesn't matter. I just want to talk about this. All right? But the, the, now let's take a minute here and consider, and I see Brian, Brian is, is quoting very passages I have in my list here. He 42.6, 42.1, 40 verses 3 and through 5. All of those passages, 49, 6, uh, Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. So all of those passages are important, and all of those passages are quoted in the Gospels. Isaiah 42 is quoted in uh, Matthew 12, and that's Jesus speaking. Uh, Isaiah 42, 6 and 49, 6, are, are, those are the background uh, statements for the passage I read just a moment ago in Luke 2, 32. Isaiah 56, 7 is the background of Mark 11, 17. And then when you look at Luke 24, Luke 24, 47, uh, the, that's a quotation of, uh, or based on quotations of Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, Isaiah 49, 22, which is also related to Micah 7, excuse me, Micah 4, and Isaiah 2, uh, and Psalm 22, 27. And that is a really uh, powerful statement there in Psalm 22, 27. If you're familiar with Psalm 22, you know that that is a messianic psalm and that it's talking about Jesus. Jesus quotes it in Matthew 27. He begins by quoting the first verse and then he hangs his head down and says it is finished there at the end. And that's also the last verse of 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 Psalm 22. But there in verse 27 of Psalm 22, the psalmist says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. All the ends of the world shall turn to the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. So to say that the Old Testament didn't anticipate a Messiah who would bring the world to himself is just utter folly. It just denies the Old Testament. So, so this is wrong. Now, I think after having gone back and read and reread many of the things that this, this person has been saying the last couple of days, what I really think they want us to, to come to is somehow say, well, Jews are made by works and real Jews are made by faith only. And she talk, uh, this person has talked about faith alone uh, to or uh, just every two two or three articles she, she, it seems like this person just writing and writing and writing and really what their objective is is to somehow say that salvation is by faith alone and again that's an idea that's not taught in the Old Testament uh, that, that I don't know where well I do too a lot of the the, the conceptions that people have about the law of Moses and I believe this is part of this this person's problem is based on what Martin Luther came away with once he was uh, once he started to come out of the Catholic Church or the Church of Rome whatever you want to call it and um, he was reacting to uh, Tetzel who was teaching that uh, indulgences could be bought from the church and thus one could actually pay for sin in advance is what it amounted to it's a it's horrible doctrine this idea of indulgences as it was originally conceived of and taught and it was a money making grab as far as the, the papacy was concerned because they were going to use the funds to pay for the new basilica in Rome. And so it, it was just a, a, a terrible, carnal doctrine that somehow you could pay the church 
and you would receive an indulgence for a sin yet to be committed in the future. Kind of sounds like that uh, prostitute there in Proverbs 7 who grabs the young man and, and she says, I have paid my vows. I have peace offerings with me today. In other words, I've already gone to the temple and I've made my sacrifices and I have peace offerings. Let's go to my house and, and commit adultery. It's all okay. And, and, and it's ridiculous. And so we understand that, that the Bible does not teach this, this idea of indulgences. But the, neither does the Bible teach that salvation is by faith alone. And from that, some have come to say, well, there's no need for obedience to the gospel. And that, that if you obey, if you tell people they have to obey, then uh, you're somehow nullifying grace and faith. Or this particular writer seems to have that is, is, well, you have to be saved by faith alone before you can obey and it be accepted. And, and this is what she's trying to, to, to contrast with, with Judaism. So Judaism, you didn't have to have any faith. You just had to be a Jew. And so you were the chosen people, and, and they were right. And if it hadn't been for Jesus coming and giving the Gentiles a different way to be saved, uh, then they would have all been lost and, and the Jews just didn't get it and, and, and she's kind of all over the place on that with with uh, one time you, you read after this person and you think well they think that the Jews are still saved in that way today that by virtue of their their descent from Abraham which is impossible to determine who wouldn't know how to do that and then the other side of that would be um, uh faith alone and then that's uh, and it's it's basically a perversion of Ephesians 2.10 where Paul says we are created created in him for good works well there's no doubt about that but their works is, is used of, of that which uh, the believer does but, it, but it, it still can't mean what this person wants to try and make it mean because Paul very clearly says in Ephesians 2, not by works wherein one can boast, right? He doesn't exclude every work. He excludes boastful works. He excludes works which uh, make it impossible. Now, we have one of our uh, listeners with us, or I don't know what to call you all. I'm going to call you students. I, some of you could be teaching me, so... Uh, I don't want to call you talkers because I'm the only one talking. But our folks, I just like folks. Let's, so, so one of our folks here mentions Genesis 15:6, and that's exactly where I want to go. But I'm going to go there by virtue of the fact of calling everyone's attention to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And, and, and the reason I do this is because the, the point of this argument is which we with which we began. The Jews were claiming de physical descent. Some of them were claiming physical descent from Abraham as what established them as kingdom citizens. And Paul's argument in Romans 4 is no faith is what establishes uh, us as kingdom citizens. Now let me say here, nobody denies that salvation is by faith. I believe salvation is by faith. I just don't believe it's by faith alone or by grace alone. I don't believe salvation is by anything alone. The, the, the ground or the, the, the basis of our justification is the death of Jesus Christ. My faith in that, all right, what, what, in what am I trusting? I'm trusting in the death of Jesus. So God reckons me righteous or reckons my faith in order to righteousness. He counts my faith unto righteousness. But is it the fact that I believed that has merit? No. It's he in whom I have believed. That is the basis. I'm trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus. And I've said this before. The person who is, who is baptized as the New Testament teaches us to be baptized is not trusting in water baptism for salvation. 
That person is trusting in the death of Jesus Christ. What does the penitent believer confess prior to water baptism? Philip said to the eunuch, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Okay, so Philip then responds in Acts 8. If thou believest, thou mayest. And the eunuch confessed, I believe that Jesus is the great. He didn't confess, I believe that water baptism will save me. I believe that the water will save me. No, he believes Jesus will save me. He believes Jesus died for his sins. And it's Jesus who made the connection to water baptism. Jesus said he that believes and is baptized. That's not anybody working for their salvation. And I, that's essential to our understanding this. Well, when we get to Romans 4, which quotes Genesis 15, 6, this is why I want to go here. Paul's argument is that Abraham is proof that salvation has always been by faith. And it's by faith to the Jew, and it's by faith to the Gentile, or as he designates them in this context here, the uncircumcised and the circumcised. And he starts out as if he's talking to Jews. He says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? That is, Abraham is, our, is the father of our flesh. We are descended from Abraham, Jews, that is. What did he find? Well... He says, verse 2, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. All right? So it wasn't the fact that he was circumcised that justified him, because God gave circumcision to Abraham. And so circumcision was the big thing, and, and that was the problem the church had in the first century there in Acts 15, was thinking that one had to be circumcised, that one had to become a Jew. And that's kind of what this person is, is railing against, but... Anyone who understands the New Testament knows that that's not what's under that that's not the basis of our justification. So to somehow think, and maybe this person's kicking against the fact that that baptism puts us into Christ, or she's kicking against what she perceives as the Church of Christ denomination. Just let me say this: I have spent my entire life trying to stay out of denominationalism. I don't. I don't want to be a member of a denomination. And and I do not use the phrase Church of Christ in any denominational sense. I don't think there is such a thing as a Church of Christ denomination, at least not from the biblical perspective. There are no denominations recognized by Jesus Christ. They're simply the church. And everyone who believes the gospel and, and is baptized into Christ, the Lord adds to his church. That's all I'm talking about. That's all I'm trying to to, to, to be a member of myself or if anyone else, I'm trying to get them to obey the gospel so once they're saved, the Lord will add them to the church. I don't add them to the church. The Lord adds them to the church. So that's the reality that we're talking about. So if here Abraham being circumcised and, and, and begetting children, so all those who are begotten of Abraham are somehow have some special relationship to God as far as their salvation is concerned. And that's not what the Bible teaches. For if it were by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. Meaning it's not that way. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and he was counted unto him for righteousness. And that's the quotation from Genesis 15, 6, to which our brother refers here in the, in the, in the feed. So not to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. Let me say that again. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. If I work all day for someone and I come to the pay window, that's not a gift. I earned that. All right? Abraham, in being recognized as God's child, did not earn that. Even though Abraham was obedient, that's the whole point in this Romans 4 context, that we have faith like Abraham had, and the faith Abraham had was an obedient faith. It did exactly what God told him to do. And thus it, it that faith, which was obedient, was reckoned. So to argue that, do you think a disobedient faith is going to be reckoned for righteousness? Certainly not. And, and anyone who understands the New Testament does not think anything the believer does earns 
salvation. Why? Because he's a believer. <laughs> That's the point. He's believing in Jesus. He's trusting in Jesus. So my faith is in Christ. My repentance is toward God and in Christ. My confession is of Christ. My baptism is into Christ. There's nothing of merit in that at all as far as Jeff Asher is concerned. But to him that worketh not, believeth, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now that passage is not saying to him that worketh not, to him that is disobedient, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's not talking about disobedient faith. That's talking about someone who's not earning anything. He's not counting on his, his intrinsic worth because of his descent from Abraham. And until we get that understanding in our head, we're never going to get what is being said here. All right? Abraham pleased God because he believed. What did he believe? He believed the promise that the Messiah would come. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man under whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So when one's sins are forgiven, that's when righteousness is reckoned. And Jesus said in Acts 2.38 through the Apostle Peter, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. There's the connection of water baptism to this question. It's not a question of earning something by water baptism. It's a question of believing what God said about it. God said the one who puts his faith in Jesus and is baptized into his death. That person is saved. Now, this question of faith, does this come only on the circumcision or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So the question is, when was faith reckoned to Abraham for righteousness? Well, Genesis 15:6 is is a statement that's made about Abraham before he received circumcision. It was while he was in uncircumcision. So I guess technically he was a Gentile. Abraham wasn't born circumcised. And those who were born into the family of Abraham were circumcised on the eighth day. Paul even boasted about that in Philippians 3 and other passages. But when was he counted righteous? When was he counted as, as a part of, the, of, of God's family or kingdom? When his faith was reckoned for righteousness. All right? So what's the point of that, Paul? Well, he received the sign of circumcision. That's chapter 17. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. So circumcision was given to him as a sign of his covenant with God based on the faith that he had when he was uncircumcised. See? that he might be the father of the, all them that believe, whether circumcised or uncircumcised, that righteousness might be reckoned to them also. The father of the circumcision to, the, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So justification is by faith to those who walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. Does that sound like someone who doesn't have to do anything to be saved? I've heard preachers, I debated a fellow one time, said, I preach a gospel where you can get saved right where you're sitting without doing anything. You don't even have to raise your hand. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to say a prayer or anything. You just, right there where you're sitting. Is that what that passage says? Who is it that has righteousness reckoned to him? Those who walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. Abraham. So this idea that the Jews somehow thought, well, just because of the very, just because of their DNA, they were saved. 
and that anybody who didn't have the DNA that they had, then that just means they're lost and going to hell. Well, that's, that's not what that passage says at all. Now, let's, let's make something clear here. That, that, that this reckoning of Abraham's faith, because I, I, had, I had this same, uh, I had another preacher say to me one time in debate, said, well, said, uh, uh, Genesis 15, 6, that's when Abraham became, that's when Abraham believed. And I said, well, wait a minute. You mean Abraham didn't have any faith when he left Ur of the Chaldees? This is not talking about one-time salvation experience. That's what people have. I think that's what this author has in mind, that you, you have this one-time salvation experience. And when you have this one-time salvation experience, when you get it, that is salvation, you can't lose it. And if you lost it, you never had it. That's the idea. If you get it, you can't lose it. If you lost it, you never had it. I've heard that so many times from so many different people. We're not talking about that kind of one-time so-called salvation experience. Abraham, from the time that God appeared to him in Mesopotamia, so that's before he left for Ur of Chaldees. So God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia. That's Acts chapter 7, which is parallel to Genesis chapter 11. All right. So God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia. Then he appeared to Abraham in Haran, and then he left and came. And a Abraham's building altars and worshiping God in Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 14, and then in Genesis 15. And he's been in the land for five or six years at this point. And, and Genesis 15 says, There's, I don't have anybody but this slave that's born in my house, Eliezer, as my heir. And God says, no, he is not the heir. You're going to have a son. And Abraham laughed. He didn't laugh like Sarah laughed. That's, all, that's a play on the word. Isaac means laughter. And so it plays on the, the, the way that these two looked at uh, Isaac. Sarah doubted, so she laughed when God challenged her on it. But Abraham laughed for joy when God told him, and he believed the promise, you see. So Abraham believed, and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. But that's talking about him five years into the land. So Abraham had been a man of faith all these years, and he continued to be a man of faith. And when you look at the quotation from Genesis 15, 6 in the New Testament, it's quoted here in Romans 4, and it specifically refers to the conception there in verse 20. It says he staggered not at the promise. That specifically refers to the conception of Isaac when Abraham went into Sarah when he was a hundred years old. The statement's made when Abraham is 80, but it's applied to him when he's a hundred, 20 years later. And then it's applied even later, almost another 20 years perhaps, uh, in, in Genesis 22 when he goes up on Mount Moriah and offers Isaac his only begotten son. And it's said in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham by faith offered Isaac. It also says in Hebrews chapter 11 that by faith Abraham uh, left the Ur of Chaldees. He obeyed. By faith Abraham obeyed. So this idea that obedience is inconsistent with faith, no. Obedience is the result of faith. Uh, and, and, and sometimes I have people say, well, you just have head faith. You don't have heart faith. You don't have heart religion because you're always talking about obedience. Look. While we're here in the book of Romans, just turn a page over. Maybe it's two pages in your Bible. And just turn over there to Hebrews, not Hebrews, Romans chapter 6. And, and listen to what he says there. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine or that form of teaching which was delivered to you. Where does obedience come from? Obedience comes from the heart and not this blood pump. I'm, I'm making a gesture there because that's what we generally think of. But obedience, that's the, the inner man, the mind. Obedience comes from the heart. You have obeyed from the heart. And so obedience is faith. It's an act of faith. Repentance is a part of faith. Confession is of faith. So certainly we are saved by faith, but it's not just the act of believing or the fact of believing. 
When we talk about salvation by faith, we're talking about the character of the salvation. It's through faith. Well, what does faith do? Faith always obeys. If there's no obedience, there's no faith. Now that's evident here in Hebrews chapter 6. You have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching. What did Moses say in Deuteronomy 6? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. All right? So that's, a, that, and that, that, even that statement, love the Lord your God with, implies obedience. This is not some abstract concept. If a man believes, he does what he believes. Uh, an, another passage that folks, you, you, folks ought to think about with regard to this, we mentioned John 3 earlier in the new birth. So let's just go back over there. Verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right? He that believeth not the Son, or he that obeys not the Son, some versions say there. Uh, same thing over in, uh, I think it's Hebrews 3. Somebody type that in there for me if I miss it here. Uh Yeah, verse 19, talking about Israel, and then he's making the comparison in chapter 4 to the believer who is going to enter into his rest, okay? So so we see there in Hebrews 3, 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief, the American standard, the new American standard, could not enter in because of disobedience. What does it mean to not believe? It means to disobey God. So then... He goes on to say there in verse 11 of chapter 4, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What does that mean? Same example of disobedience. So that, that takes care of both sides of that question tonight, that it's not by faith only, and uh, as far as coming into Christ is concerned, but it is through faith that we remain a Christian. And so faith is not a one-time act. Faith is something that we continue to practice in Hebrews 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Well, this has been a pleasure tonight. We're out of time. We appreciate the fact that you have joined us. Uh, we'll come back next week and, and answer some questions. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise right now that I'm going to come back to John's question on 1 Corinthians 15. I hope you weren't trying to get a sermon up for Sunday. If you were, call me. Uh, but talking about flesh and blood... Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, that's a great question, and it's going to take longer uh, to, to deal with that than I have time tonight, or I'm actually prepared to do it. I'll be honest about it. I need to do a little study to be able to, 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 to express it. We're going to post these notes for those of you who'd like to have them. And as always, thank you so much for joining us tonight.